Good evening. I'm Marion Smith, Secretary of the Royal Scottish Academy. I'm delighted to welcome such a large audience to the RSA Metstein Architecture Discourse 2016. This is the third discourse in the series founded to celebrate the memory of Izzy Metstein RSA. Above all, the RSA Metstein Architecture Discourse celebrates Izzy's engagement with the discipline of architecture. His insights, scrutiny, sense of humour and acerbic wit touched all those he taught. Beyond the university context, he continued to mentor his past students and has been extremely influential to contemporary architecture practice in Scotland. We are most grateful for the support of the Scottish Government in presenting this series. Izzy was a partner in the Glasgow practice of Gillespie, Kidd and Coya. Here he worked with his long-term collaborator, Andy McMillan, RSE. Earlier this year, I was lucky enough to visit their masterwork, <coughs> St Peter's Seminary, Cardross, as it was made accessible for a special event heralding the launch of the Year of Innovation, Architecture and Design, a testimony to its significance. Izzy taught at the Macintosh School of Architecture in Glasgow, the University of Dublin and the Architecture Association in London. He was Professor of Architecture here at the University of Edinburgh from 1984 to 1991. We are extremely grateful to the University for its cooperation in the use of this lecture theatre. Previously, we have been honoured to host two eminent speakers, Alvaro Siza from Portugal in 2014 and Glenn Market crossing the globe from Australia in 2015. Now at this point, I would like to remind you to please make sure that you have your telephones switched off there is no fire alarm um, planned for this evening, so if the fire alarm goes, it is a fire and the exits are either side where you came in and on the half landing there are uh, fire escapes there. I'm now going to hand over to Charlie Sutherland, RSA, who will introduce the 2016 RSA Metstein Architecture Discourse. Charlie. <coughs> Thank you, Mary. I'm very honoured to be standing up here tonight to introduce to you one of the most influential and significant architects practising in the world today. Peter Zumthor was my immediate choice when it came to my turn to organise this event, the third in the series of the Metstein Discourses. Over the past 40 years, the impact of his work from the modest studio in Haldenstein, Switzerland, has been extraordinary both in both its influence on the profession and generations of students of architecture globally. <coughs> the extraordinary diversity of his work from landscapes to chapels, old person's housing, world famous spa, and now of course LACMA <laughs> in LA, all embrace a world of rich complexity and yet embody a profound simplicity touching the soul of all who engage with it. He describes himself as an artist's architect. I think it is simply that he is in the greatest tradition of the greatest architects who practice the art of architecture. The thoughtful and precisely tuned reading and response to place, insightful understanding and interpretation of use, and a truly masterful command of materials and detail all conspire to conjure places of intense atmosphere and, mag and magic, and a process of design and making in what I can only describe as alchemy. So when I wrote to Peter <coughs> over a year ago, a letter asking if he might come and visit our small country, <coughs> excuse me, 
and speak in this series, I, don't, I did not really imagine that he might, amongst his enormous number of other invitations around the world, accept this invitation. <coughs> However, during a week-long tour of his buildings in March, when I visited his studio in Haldenstein, I learned that a young Irish assistant in his office had seen the title Metstein Discourse and promoted this forlorn request to the top of the pile and said to Peter, you must do this one. <laughs> <coughs> well, I don't know his name, but I think we are all tonight most grateful to him <laughs> and to Peter in taking his advice. As a token of our appreciation, I have a book from Danny Metzstein of the work of GKC, a gift from Danny and, his fa and her family, Izzy, Izzy's family, who are sitting in the audience here tonight. <coughs> I'm also personally very grateful to Peter for, pe for making the time in this extraordinarily busy schedule and come and talk to us here tonight. His working life is busier than ever, with commissions and competition wins recently all over the world. <coughs> and you can imagine Edinburgh is not really on his route anywhere. <laughs> when we chatted earlier this year, <coughs> he did say, I hope it's a nice space. <laughs> it's really difficult talking about architecture in a bad space. And despite the University of Edinburgh's very kind support of the RSA with the free use of this room, I was hopeful that we might be able to host this event in a more memorable architectural space. <coughs> At one point, even Cardross Seminary was rather optimistically considered. Well, I hope that Peter can forgive us for common sense and pragmatism prevailing over poetic and atmospheric in this, in this instance. <clears throat> and I'm sure most of you tonight are probably very relieved we're not standing in the damp darkness of an autumn evening in Cardross. <clears throat> Anyways, <coughs> so to, tonight's format, slightly different from previous years. Past two events, we had Alvaro Cesar, who talked about his ideas through one single recent project, and Glenn Merkett, who discussed the environmental context as his muse and genesis of all that he does. This evening, <coughs> it's going to be a little bit more in the spirit of the title of this event, a discourse, a conversation. Peter has invited a guest, Marion Londorf, to be a conversation partner for the next half an hour. And then there is also going to be uh, a lecture from Peter, which actually was a last minute surprise for us. He's going to talk about LACMA. <coughs> anyway, Marion, just to introduce Marion, uh, Lohndorf is <coughs> the arts correspondent from the, <coughs> if forgive my pronunciation here, the Neue Zucher Zeitung, Switzerland, um, choosing, <coughs> choosing and reporting about a wide range of cultural subjects from theatre to the arts, exhibitions, and cultural institutions. <coughs> Her work involves conducting interviews and writing features and profiles on artists with trend reports, book reviews, and stories including film, photography, literature, architecture, and fashion. <coughs> she is the author and co-author of a number of films, books, among them studies on the works of Louis Buñuel, Ingmar Bergman, and Robert De Niro for the annual retrospective section of the Berlin Film Festival. <coughs> Marion worked in the same function as an arts correspondent in London, 2001 to 2004, for DPA, the German press agency. Back then, the fourth biggest news agency in the world. And before that, for 13 years, she, she was with the Frankfurter Allemagne Zeitung in Germany as a freelance arts writer. <coughs> Finally, just to say, Peter was slightly reluctant to um, actually show any he said he's given up lecturing about his work many years ago. <coughs> but I think we're very, very honoured tonight that he's going to actually discuss his latest project in Los Angeles for LACMA. I hand over now to Peter. Thank you very much indeed. Can you 
hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, you can. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you for the invitation to come here. I've been here 55 years ago. Okay. <laughs> Most of you were still up on a cloud waiting to come down. <laughs> okay. Now this is a, I was last week, maybe, in London talking at Freeze Art Fair because I thought I should go there. The, the theme, the topic is interesting. Spaces for art. And since I'm struggling again with museums and so on, there's a moment when I think I should go and see whether I can talk about what I'm doing. So sort of like going on to work and see, can I bring this to terms, what I'm doing, and look at the faces of the audience, whether it's convincing or not. Okay. So I decided this afternoon, I dare to repeat this experience again <laughs> for you. So uh, you forgive me, you come after the Londoners, but I didn't know I could have started here. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, I do the same thing talking about one aspect of this Los Angeles project, which is what kind of spaces for art am I trying to do? Okay, now I need this thing here. Yeah. So, <laughs> What I have to do is an encyclopedic <coughs> museum. So you know what an encyclopedic museum is? A lot of objects. In this case, some think something like 125,000 different things. Most of these things are not paintings. They're not made to hang on a wall. Like artists nowadays, the contemporary artists make things which say, I would love to be in a museum, right? <laughs> so that they come from many, many different places and from many different times. <coughs> and I, my personal conception of an encyclopedic museum is it's sort of a fortunate uh, failure. The failure part is, of course, the idea, you know, this, this comes from the 18th century enlightenment, we collect the world, right, from north to south, from west to east, and over the whole timeline from ancient times to today, catalog it and show it. Uh, the encyclopedic kind of uh, thing. And there is the failure because we all know this is not possible. We cannot catalog the world. <laughs> Thank God it's a bit bigger. It doesn't get into catalogs, okay? So, but still we know these museums where we have a lot of objects and a lot of labels and, uh, and they tell this is this and then this, east, south, west, later, and so on. That's this museum. So what's the good part? <laughs> I think the weakness of the encyclopedic museum is also its greatness because they're all incomplete. Uh, they're all incomplete in a different way. Okay? So you talk to a museum's director of an encyclopedic museum, not only the V&A or the Met, also smaller ones, and they will tell you, my collection is the best and unique in the world. Okay? And they are always right. <laughs> because they, this is like a, a you know this, they, the collection they have in these museums, this is like the contingency of life, you know. Somebody brought something in and somebody brought this and then they're really strong on Asian art of 2000 before Christ and there's nothing about Mexico. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know this, so this is uh, it's beautiful that they're all very specific because it's accident which brought these collections together. That's also the case in Los Angeles. Unique. Let's look at a few things. So 
the sort of, of course, my favorite <laughs> uh, Buddha, I guess. Many of the objects are really small. This is a very big carpet, famous one. I think there's some Korean wrapping cloth that is, you know, this Korean tradition of this beautiful wrapping. Look at this guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's something ritual or religious. Uh, she, I like her. She's called Pepita. He is a poet. Uh, the, of course, they're really strong there in California on things like that. Like this is from a project from Neutra, from one house. They have lots of furniture and they have polka dot dresses and beautiful things. I wonder what this is. I have no idea. <laughs> it's about the size of a human being. It's an American piece. That's clear, right? We l I love the blue, like everybody else. Uh, photos, big photos collection. This is an early te print technique. Once used. Of course, uh, great artist. Or this, right? They have a lot of costumes uh, in their collection, textiles. Okay, collection spaces. What kind of collection spaces do I want to make? This is my ideal. <laughs> this is... Uh, Palazzo Fortuni in Venice, an old palazzo used, as you can see, for exhibitions and this kind of space, so rich of light and shadow, reflections on the floor, historic fe feeling of history in the walls, and so. So do you think you can all you could put any kind of art there? It will look good, because the environment is so good. So if my museum would have maybe only half of this quality of this atmosphere, I would be really happy, let me tell you. <laughs> of course, history cannot be in, uh, imitated. History, yeah, this, this building has a history. But to get there atmosphere-wise would be beautiful. <coughs> it's also there. Paride. By Canova, you know the classicist Canova, and I think he really likes the space party. There, can you see? Yeah, <laughs> he feels at home, right? <laughs> and I love this light from the side, which produces the shadows and lights, and it has this. I think it has a nice domestic atmosphere. That's what I like the most. If you can see objects in a domestic atmosphere, in a space which has the, where the light comes in, and as deeper you go into the building, the darker it gets. And this is my task, you see. Now he lost his home. <laughs> 
that what I have to do, I have these many, many objects there, and they have lost their home. They're actually a little bit homeless, right? They're there as objects, but in many cases, not even the curators know exactly where they come from and where was the context and was, was the proper context. And still they're there, and I think this is my noble <laughs> duty to create a beautiful new home for these things there. As I told you, <coughs> most of the things lost their context and are not paintings, like uh, wall pieces. So the project, when I look at the objects, I think I would like to make spaces which are good for the objects so they have a new home. So they can be there and they can be there, curators put this and that together, energies between the objects start to flow. Uh, so from the objects, but now uh, a couple of remarks or two or three things to what do I want for the experience of us, the visitors? What should they experience? And for me, this is three things I would like to accomplish. First, a complete freedom of circulation and making a personal experience. So this would be the opposite of a guided tour, okay? where somebody already knows everything I don't yet know, but my, I want to have the freedom to make our own experience. That would be nice. So didactical things, they should be there, but they should be in the background, not in the foreground. You know, <laughs> you know maybe you share this feeling, sometimes you see a group of people behind a guide, you know, and they sort of tiredly walk through the halls and listen and listen and listen and you have the feeling they don't even look anymore. Okay, that's point one. The museum should enable a personal experience before somebody tells me what to think or feel. Second, a feeling for the depth of time. I can look at objects like before and I think, who made this? What was this? Look at it and so on. So all of a sudden I think there have been people before me. There have been many, many people before me. There have been cultures and so I don't understand. But they speak to me, the objects. So the feeling of the depth of time that's, I think, a very noble kind of <coughs> task <coughs> museums, my opinion, museums <coughs> should provide, or should allow for. And is this at all clear what I'm saying? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, so the third one would be, or is, the experience of beauty. I look at an object and I start to see its secret, its beauty, and so on. And I would like to make a museum where this experience is possible. Because in many places where you have objects, there is too much and too many explanations. And you don't even see anymore the people run. I myself do this sometimes or catch myself running around reading the tags next to the paintings yeah, instead of looking. Yeah. You know what I mean? So the experience of beauty, the experience of art. You can say the experience of art, this is nothing objective. It's subjective. It happens in my heart and in your heart. That's fine. It's there. It happens. That's I think should be at the beginning of the experience in a museum. So bottom line there, trust the object. 
And you know, uh, maybe you, you share this feeling, as soon as I, I'm touched by an object, by a piece of art, then I want to know more. And then I go to the curator and say, hey, could you tell me what is this and what do you know about that? and so on. Not the other way around. Okay. This is my the basic idea of my museum. Two levels, okay. One level floating above ground. This is the exhibition level. This is 15,000 square meters of encyclopedic museum on one level. No hierarchy, the bad guys down, the, the worst objects up, all the same, one level. And then above, a roof. Big overhang roof, so everything is horizontal, one level, no hierarchy. On the ground, there's a park. And there are other, all the other more profane, commercial, funny uh, things the museum has, from restaurants to a theater and so on and so on, what you expect. They are on the park ground level, which is completely transparent. Or not comp how I? Yeah, it's open, it's open, okay. I'm not going to talk about that, okay? Three types, so you will see the museum has three types of spaces. The uh, central space has clear story light and is uh, baptized by my director, Michael Govan, as chapel gallery. It has this tall, clear story light. And then left and right, let me see. Well, you're all architects, you can read sections, you know. This is there and there. <laughs> These are the galleries looking out to the city, all around. So this glass there runs around the building and is then there, and so on. So you'll see afterwards, I'm not going to talk about it, the museum on one level is a uh, solitaire building, I think architects say. It's like a flower <laughs> or an uh, object. It doesn't have a back. Like a glass doesn't have a back in plan, right? Something like that, like a flower. Okay, so we have these things here that we call Meander Gallery, and they have my beloved sidelight, as you can see, there and there. And why they call called Meander Galleries, you see in a moment. And then between, we have cabinet galleries. And the cabinet galleries, the, the, maybe you can say this is the more sacred space. This is the profane space. And this is maybe 18th century. I think there you will see afterwards, they're a bit dark. And they, there you can make collections, like the, the curators can make, they can also use labels, they have a big, freedom, and they are artificial light, artificially lit. So let's see. So this is the plan. I'm not going to talk about the shape, okay? <laughs> you just have to take it and accept it. <laughs> <laughs> Chapel gallery, chapel gallery. So in each cluster has a chapel gallery. It's surrounded by cabinet galleries and is surrounded by these meandering galleries here, which have side light. Very light, darker, 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 darker light. So, okay. so you have the whole range from shadow to light all the time. And here is the principle of free circulation i love this you know nobody tells me where to go <laughs> i hate this uh, i think i do hate it yeah if i have a corridor and i have to go there door there da, da. so no period uh, no sequence of period halls i find my own way i would love i think you should have all we should all have the freedom to find our own way and the principle is maybe a bit like you walk in the woods and you go from clearing to clearing. 
you never know exactly what happens. Or maybe a park is, uh, maybe an English landscape park is in a similar way organized. The freedom So here you see them. The chapel gallery is the light ones with the clear story light from high above. The brown, the cabinets with artificial light with the special uh, dense up atmosphere of lot of collections and things. And then here black, the beyond the gallery. And you can see this in plan you can always look out, you never get lost. As you wander around, you can always look out, all around. So you're always in contact to the city at the moment. I think there are very few five meters here before you see out there, from there to there. That's important orientation. This is clear to us. The orientation is important. I should not get lost in my forest here. And the other one is, it's open. The museum is open. If you know the Baylor Museum in Basel, I think the success of that museum is its openness to the landscape. It's friendly. And if you go there, you don't think it's not a treasure box, ma treasure box made out of granite <coughs> where you, as a boy, think, well, to go in there, you need a university degree or something. So this is an accessible kind of, uh, very, should be very accessible to everybody. A palace for everybody. Openness. Yeah, Frank Geary saw this, this he said, that's a good thing. It only has three details and it's open to the outside. <laughs> okay. Compliment from Frank, three details. <laughs> he said, you understand America. <laughs> Circulation. So you can then add these lines and do the, you can imagine this. With the going, getting into the clusters, coming out, etc. Chapel galleries. Here you see them, huh? Okay. So this one in front here, this is a landscape project for Bavaria. And the one there in the back, these are my mountains in the atelier, okay? But do, these are the eight chapels here. One, two, three, here they are. Tomorrow I, I like to go home. <laughs> I get nostalgic when I see the space, okay? Tomorrow I'll be there again. One, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, not now, let's see. Of course, as you've seen, they're all different. They all have their the small and big, taller and a bit lower, and so on. Okay, soon we're done, right? <laughs> Cabinet galleries. Okay, now the, you can see the, they form these clusters around the uh, chapel galleries. Uh, the meander galleries, the third type, the profane, where we think, the director and I, we think there could be lots of things happening. They don't have to be so uh, holy and so on. So there could be 
poetry readings, people discuss, discussing, uh, children running around and so on. Here, this is now this uh, reddish kind of thing. So, uh, let's try to always see out to the city. You get this past transversal passages, or then this uh, along the facade, these passages where you go into the cabinets, go out. So I think he is quite okay. <laughs> he, he starts to look happy, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not yet finished, huh? okay? This is a picture of the inauguration of the building. Uh, 2023. Okay, some time to go. Mm -hmm. 